Well, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. Glad you're here with us this morning. Whether you're with us online, if you would like to uh, let us know that you're watching online, please say hi in the notes and uh, uh, so that we can understand that you're with us. Hey, we have a great day outside here. Isn't it beautiful? The weather, the change in temperatures, so it's not burning hot outside. Uh, we're not dodging tornadoes and it's not pouring down rain. This is a good day. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So if you have a chance to get out here before it turns blazing hot again, and get some things done, now's the time to do it. We got a lot of stuff going on here this week at uh, Gray Street. So Wednesday, we continue on with our sermon series on the Bible mini-series that we have. And that's a pretty good in-depth look at, at things that are coming through. And it kind of puts things in perspective as we've read these stories in the Bible for many, many years. Now we get to kind of watch it on screen and get a little different take on it. Yes, they do take some artistic license, but it's a really good time. Uh, Wednesday, 7 o'clock p.m., we go into our next series in here. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Then we jump ahead to Saturday, and Saturday is movie night here. So we're going to convert this into a movie theater again. 6 o'clock p.m., the movie starts. 5.30, the door is open. Of course, as always, we have all kinds of good refreshments in here. Popcorn and brownie bites and uh, drinks and all kinds of good stuff there for the movie. Priceless. And that's what we're going to be showing. And that is where uh, James, who is played by Joel Smallbone from for King and Country, um, he becomes desperately in need of money to take care of his daughter and everything after uh, some really, really horrible things going on in his life. So he, he does kind of a desperation move and, and decides that, yes, he'll agree to drive this box truck across country. No questions asked. And be sure you don't open the back end of it. And in the process, then, he finds out that he was in the process of human trafficking, and then he goes to try and set the thing right. Uh, it's a great movie. Kleenexes will be necessary, so I just want to warn you ahead of time that, that this one's going to be a tearjerker. I tried not to have a tearjerker the last time, but that didn't work too well either. Anyway, our next men's breakfast then follows that up on August 3rd at 9 o'clock here, and so that's always a great time. Um, as usual, we will be having biscuits and gravy and some other Fun things. I, I did come up with some really neat things that I was looking at here that we might be able to cook up on this one here. In just addition to. to. In exactly. addition to, in addition yeah. To. Not instead of, but in addition no to. Right. So you're safe, Denny. Uh, then, following up the next week, August 10th, we're going to have Orange Track Racing uh, back here again. We had a really good time this last time around. And speaking of Orange Track Racing, Terry and I went out to the factory in, in Anamosa this week and uh, for Blue Track is what they call themselves, bluetrack.org and so they make race injected molded race tracks, one piece. Oh wow. And so um, I, I got us some new race track and then they gave us some practice sets. It's going to take some finagling to get it to work with the Hot Wheels stuff because their track is really nice. Uh, but it doesn't exactly match up to Hot Wheels. Uh, so we have a little bit of work to do that. We'll have to do that off-season. I hope Terry's going to show us what the blue track's like. Um, well, they're all... <laughs> that was a good idea while it lasted. Yeah. I tried. One um, continuous track. So it's awesome. it, it's, it's two sets of two lane that will go down the, yeah. the wooden track that we have. And, we have like, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly what this is going to look like when it's all said and done, but they were so awesome and gifted us uh, some other pieces of track and things in there that we can use as well. Um, and then they gave me some stuff to play with so I can figure out the transitioning between the two sets of racetrack. So starting off next season, we won't be doing that yet this season, but starting off next season then we'll have fresh new track to go down and uh, we have to figure out exactly how that's going to work. But though, those people were so great. Uh, if you get up on their Facebook place page, please tell them thank you for all that they did for us in here. So it was, it's absolutely awesome. 
And uh, so, some fun things ahead here for Orange Track Racing, even though it's wood. <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure that out, and when I paint the rails, side rails on the track or the wooden track and things, uh, orange or something like that, so we can still have a similarity to Orange Track. But, uh, so it was a very good week. God had his hand in that with us when we went out there. Uh, just a great group of people to, to meet with, and they just bent over backwards, uh, hospitality-wise. It, it was awesome. So today's worship music and things are going to be uh, being put into the notes section for Facebook. Please make sure that you click on the links and listen to the songs as well so you get the music in song as well as in word today and so we just praise you and thank you lord for bringing that into our presence today let us enter into the time of worship shall we gracious god we thank you for this day for all the many blessings that you give us each and every day and we just ask that you would open our eyes to see those blessings we open our ears to you and to hear your message in word today and in song and we we thank you lord that you gave uh, Pastor Terry this message this morning to share with us and the message that you put on his heart uh, as we continue on through our sermon series that matches up to our Bible study as well. So we just praise you and thank you Lord that you've done that for us and that we are in your presence today freely and openly. We open our hearts to you today to receive that message in and to live it out each and every day. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. So our call to worship this morning comes from Daniel 3, 16 through 18, and then this comes from the New King James Version. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered to the king and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king, but not... Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And this, of course, was a time when uh, these, these kids were teens, and they, they were going to be sentenced to death in the fiery furnace that King Nebuchadnezzar had, who served pagan gods. And so he was going to send them in there because they refused to worship his golden image that he had created, a constructive man. So in this passage, Daniel then speaks volumes about the saving power of faith. And this is what this whole chapter is in Daniel. Uh, chapter 3 in Daniel is all about faith and, and what God will do if you have faith. And so the, this story tells us of that saving power of our God. God can save his people from circumstances that humans would consider impossible. Other gods cannot defend the interests against him. And King Nebuchadnezzar believed that his pagan god was mightier than the god of the Jews. And so he had sentenced these kids to die in the furnace because they would not, they would not bow down and worship him or his gods. But see, his pagan god was a man-made construct, meaning... It was something that was just made up, and this is what he wanted to be. And as such, that construct had no power, had no authority, had nothing to do. So God proved this out through a miracle. Now, miracles distinguish God from all of the other false gods out there served by other people. The miracle here, then, shows us that it may be acceptance to the rules of existence. So obviously, if you normally would go into a fiery furnace, you're going to be burned to pieces, right? But God then takes this and says, no, this miracle is going to show you that you're not only going to not be burned up in the fire, but you're going to come through without even the smell of smoke on you. Normally, fire kills and destroys people, but God's presence saved those three Jewish kids in an exceptional way because God chose this time to reveal his power to the people, but more importantly, to King Nebuchadnezzar, who was really in power. It wasn't king, it was God. So even, and, and oh by the way, I'll, I'll take you back a step. This was a kairos moment. I had to throw that in there. So remember that Greek word kairos? 
it was the appropriate time, that point in time that God chose to reveal himself. And that is a Kairos moment. Even the pagan king had to acknowledge the unique and saving power of the king of Israel. God. He was the true king of Israel. But it was more than that. It was a testament to the power of faith. God didn't spare these kids from the fire. They still had to endure that fire. But through their faith, he saved them from the consequences of that fire. The reality of being burned alive. So God is not only a miracle worker, but God is, in this instance, he was their savior at that point. When God's people proved faithful to him, then he saved them by faith, in other words, and other powers and authorities cannot do and couldn't do, not by human means whatsoever. Human faithfulness may mean risking death to say true to God, but serving our God may mean that we will still face evil and suffering, but our faith produces that protection that God will give us because that's what God is looking for. And he's wanting us to be able to endure these things. So endurance brings us through. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed that God was able to deliver them from the fiery furnace. If God had chosen not to deliver them, they still would have remained faithful to them by their words. And that's kind of a key point. God did, however, deliver them, but their faith was based on, not based on the expectation of the miracle, but just simply that they believed that God was who he was and he could do what he said he could do. So similarly, our faith is based on his basic character, the character of God, not that absence of suffering. And a lot of people think that, that they go through suffering in their life and God is abandoned. But that's not it. That's not the case. He brings us through the suffering. He brings us through the trials of life. So God is able to relieve our suffering, but sometimes we will not experience that miraculous divine inter the intervention. But God will still choose to sustain us in the midst of our difficulty rather than removing the problem from us. So let us prepare ourselves then to hear the message that Pastor Terry has brought forth for us today as we journey from victim to victor. Gracious Lord, we just ask right now that you open our hearts and that you would bless the message that Pastor Terry is going to give us today. We ask that you would help us to live that message out and to understand all of the nuances in the message that you put into your word. So help us to understand and clarify. Bring us that discernment of your message today. We praise you and thank you in these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. We got a rookie back there running a PowerPoint for us. Thanks, Ashlyn. You're welcome. Our granddaughters and grandson are here today. Not all of them, three of them, three out of the four. So we're thrilled to have them here today. Kind of the Victor type moment. And we'll see how this goes. Um, for those of you watching online, yes, the uh, countdown did restart. And you got a two year old, that'll happen. And so we thank you for being patient with us. Um, this morning, as I think of victim to victim, and I walk by the treat table as I come up here, and I'm just like, no, I'm going to be a victor. I'm going to skip that and just come up, not get the sugar high, not be a victim to my own concept, or choices. But it, it really is one of the things we see in the world a lot today. People are in this victim mentality. But it, it's not that long ago that no one wanted to be a victim. In fact, we would fight through whatever it was to be a victor, and many times at any cost. So we would get out there and do whatever it took. In a job that I had, I was working 100 plus hours a week. I was burning out and rather than play victim when I got called into the boss's office to have a chat, I chose to move forward in victory. I 
fought and clawed my way back into the good graces of my uh, superiors. I didn't just roll over and give up, which is what most people do. They just say, okay, fine, I'm out of here and go try and find something else. We fought. But in our society today, it feels like people are fighting through whatever it is to see who can be the biggest victim, who can get the most attention because they are a victim. Uh, I was telling Mark before service that there is someone out there who, because of the uh, IT crash of the internet here the other day, is suing an airline because they were late to getting where they needed to be. There is nothing about that that is, makes sense to me. That is a victim mentality. What can I get out of it because I was wronged? It was something that the airline could even begin to get around. In times past, being the victor put us in charge. Today, being the victim does that. If you look at the world today and you read the headlines, you watch the news, you see that the victims are the ones that are seemingly out on top, making the most noise and getting whatever it is that they want. In fact, instead of becoming overcomers, we've become a society of, oh, woe is me. Oh, poor me. That wouldn't have worked 84 years ago. 84 years ago, in May of 1940, the British and French Allied forces had been badly defeated in Germany, or in France, by the German forces. And somewhere in the neighborhood of 350,000 troops were sitting ducks. They'd been backed up to the Sea of Dunkirk on the coast of France, and time was running out. And no, with no place to go, you could almost say their days were numbered. In an order that came out of nowhere, and it ran all the way up to the, the German leader and said, hey, uh, we don't want to take the ground troops in there. We might lose too many tanks and other things. So um, we're just going to leave it to the Luftwaffe. Let the Air Force take care of it. God's hand was in this. And then the German Air Force dropped leaflets, pamphlets that says, um, surrender, there's no hope of escape. Then late in the night of May 25th, knowing that this could be the end, the British commander at Dunkirk sent out a simple three-word, very cryptic message that uh, many people in Britain might not even get today. Three words, but if not. The next day, King George VI declared a national day of prayer and a call for help was sent out. What God orchestrated through this reminds me of a scene we watched on Wednesday night when we saw Moses slam his staff to the ground. The waters swirled up and the waters parted. Well, the waters didn't part on the English Channel, but what did happen is hundreds of boats from hundreds and hundreds of English people, not in the army, not in the navy, not any, not anything. They were just simple civilians. They hopped in their boats. Even a racing yacht got involved. And they crossed the English Channel to Dunkirk and started ferrying the men out to the boat, the naval boats. And over the course of 10 days, they would get them to safety. Here's another thing. So since the Germans had gone just with the Air Force, God messed with the weather on them and they got grounded. They couldn't even fly in to strafe the ground or drop bombs. That cryptic three word message was understood by people of England because it's estimated at the time 80% of them knew the meaning of but if not. So let's go back to our call to worship this morning from Daniel. 
that Mark read this morning. And listen for those three words. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Bless you. This story that I read before this passage is often referred to as the miracle at Dunkirk. Certain annihilation of 350,000 troops turned into a reason for hope. Here's the thing. Had those boats not shown up, do you know what those 350,000 troops would have done? They wouldn't have been waving a white flag. They would have fought to the lost, to the last man. They would have fought tooth and nail. Now, they retreated, yes. They were able to regroup and fight another day. Retreat doesn't always mean defeat. And what happened? Over the next several years, they would become out victorious. They would go from being the victor, victims in, at Dunkirk to victors. They may have lost the battle, they didn't lose the war. Stories like this and those in the Bible not only inspire us, but they also define us and guide us throughout our lives. Today we're going to take a deeper look into the Bible story that inspired that cryptic three-word message. It's a story of a time when the entire nation of Israel was reduced to nothing, to rubble, to victimhood. God had a plan. And we shouldn't be surprised because he always has a plan. And it's not just a plan for one, it's a plan for all of us, each and every one. God's plan of salvation. It's the same plan he has for each of us. That turned them from victim to victor. Now I love how the stories in the book of Daniel provide us with inspiring insights into how he takes us on that journey. This morning, we're going to look at three ways through three different parts of three different chapters on how we can be victorious. The first of these ways is that I can be victorious because there is a God in heaven. Now, there are two parts of the book of Daniel. We're going to hang out in the first part, which is the first six chapters. But they both have this theme of how faithful God is, and he is the God who rules over all. We'll be focusing on this first part of Daniel this morning, and like I said, verse, chapters 2, 3, and 6. And these are chapters that tell us about the life of Daniel and his friends, who along with the other exiles were forcibly taken from the homes of Judah. They would be resettled some 500 plus miles away by King Nebuchadnezzar to a place that did not know God, nor did they worship God. It is in this part of Daniel that we learn how the Israelites learned to live as God's people in a foreign and often hostile land. It's a lesson that we as citizens of heaven, living here on earth, a foreign and hostile land. Today we'll be looking through these and we will be looking at situations that Daniel and his friends go through. Now, as we get past Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we get to Daniel, who had become one of Nebuchadnezzar's many court advisors. Now, it's ironic that the very king who tried to make victims of him and his people made him one of the court advisors. So as Mark was talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I, I remembered this past Wednesday, I made an offhand remark because it was hot. <laughs> it's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego coming out of the fiery furnace. But there was one more. They were not alone. And neither, 
they nor Daniel throughout the book of Dan uh, these stories that we read are alone. Now one day the king had a dream that no one in the court could explain. And since no one could explain it, he issued an order to have all of them killed. And these were the, these were the court helpers and administrators who were supposed to be able to help the king and advise him. And because they couldn't give him any inkling as to what was happening based on his dream, he said, kill them all. Daniel and his friends asked God for help, and God answered their prayers in a vision. Daniel then to, told Eric, the king's assassin, that he could interpret the dream. And that's where we'll turn to in Daniel 2, verses 25 and 28. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man Enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Daniel was telling the king, my God can. There's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and because of that truth, we don't have to be victims. We don't have to resign ourselves to our current circumstances. We do not have to settle for the status quo any more than Dave, or Daniel and his friends did. He faced a royal decree, a kingly contract on his life, but there is a God in heaven. Now, you may feel like your situation is impossible, but there is a God in heaven. You may be burdened by sin or sickness, but there is a God in heaven. You may see no way to improve your dead-end marriage, your dead-end job, or your dead-end life, but there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, who can redeem you from your past, and who can give you boldness and confidence in your future. But that's not all Daniel's story is about. It's also our story. And it's our story in another way as well as Daniel's. And it is, I can be victorious because my God is able to deliver. This chapter tells the memorable story of a golden image that the king had made. So as we look through Daniel 3, this image is a mammoth, 90 foot tall. And to put that in perspective, try nine stories tall building. And the king issued a command that everyone in his kingdom must bow down to it. And everyone did, except for three Jews whose Babylonian names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't bow. And that's what we're going to pick up in Daniel 3, starting verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to do, or what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Even if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times 
hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. You ever feel like you're thrown into the proverbial blazing furnace? Like whatever you're going through is just tossing you into the furnace? I don't know about you, when I get into a situation like that, I don't necessarily feel like I'm in a furnace, but my body temperature, my core body temperature rises. And I could be sitting still in a room that's 60 degrees and I'll be sweating. Because that's just the way my body reacts to things like that. But they had faith. We too are children of God. And we face those difficult choices. Difficult choices can be, what do I do with my job? If I'm in a dead-end job and I, I want to move forward or I, I want to break free and I want to do something else. There's difficult choices. For those who are challenged by their finances, it's a matter of, do I pay this bill, that bill, or do I put food on the table? All difficult choices. We have to choose between compromise and conviction. But we can be victorious. As they told the king, the God we serve is able to deliver us. So let's see how this concludes, starting in verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This story is in no way a guarantee that we'll never have to go through life without pain, without injury, without suffering. But it is a reminder of the promise from Psalm 34, 17 that says the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. <coughs> It was because of their faith that these three men were able to say to the king, if that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And then they said, but if not. And then they refused to bow down to his gods. God is able, but if not, we will not serve your gods or worship your idol. Is how I kind of read that all in a nutshell. Not going to happen. I would say it was at that very moment, not when they walked out of the fiery furnace, that they journeyed from victim to victor. They were victorious before they even were led into that fiery furnace. Their trust in God and their obedience to him brought the victory. We can have that same confidence. 
because God is able to save and deliver us. I mean, look at the stories in the Bible. We've got Noah and his family who were saved from a flood. He was able to save a whole nation of people from slavery in Egypt. He was able to save the kingdom of Israel from oppression by Philistines, Moabites, and Edomites. And he is able to save and deliver each and every one of us right here, right now, today. He is able to do things for you that you cannot do for yourself. He is able to do things with you that you can't even imagine. We can be victorious because, as Daniel said, there is a God in heaven. We can be victorious because, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God is able to deliver. And we can be victorious. In our last statement here that says, I can be victorious because my God sent. Daniel would continue to serve the royal courts long after Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon had been conquered. In this new empire, Daniel continued to faithfully pray to God three times a day. There were those among the court officials who resented Daniel. We don't see that in the world today, do we? People resent other people. But he not only still had influence in the government, but his influence was growing. These officials that were so against him, they plotted against him, and they ultimately convinced King Darius to make a proclamation. He proclaimed that for 30 days, no one could pray to anyone but to the king. 30 days. I don't know about you, but I can't even get out of bed without saying a quick prayer. I know there are people out there who say they're Christians, who can or could and do go 30 days and even longer without saying a prayer. Those who were resentful of Daniel were 100% correct in knowing that he couldn't or wouldn't. Even after the decree was signed, Daniel continued to pray three times a day. Now, that put King Darius in a very difficult position because he looked to Daniel for advice. He was growing in his influence. He liked Daniel. In fact, he even wanted to promote him. And he had no choice but to enforce his own law. And that punishment for Daniel was to be thrown in a lion's den. Now, if you've been to the zoo, you know when they're throwing fresh meat into the lion's den at the zoo, they waste no time in getting to their meal. Having to do this caused the king to suffer from a very sleepless night. So let's pick up the rest the Paul Harvey rest of the story in Daniel 6, starting in verse 19. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried into the lion's den, or hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the most living God, how has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I have was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And then... When Daniel was lifted out of, from the den, no wounds were found on him because he had trusted in his God. I want that. I want that. Did you hear what he said in verse 22? My God sent. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. My God sent his angel. My God sent. Daniel was rescued because God sent Someone. As children of God, we can all say the same. A little different in our case. God didn't send an angel. He sent his one and only son. 
The most familiar and probably the world's most popular Bible verse puts it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Because my God sent, I can be victorious over temptation and sin. Because your God sent, you can be victorious over temptation and sin. We can be victorious over shame and guilt. We can be victorious over death and the devil. We can be victorious over all the evil and filth of this world. It's because our God sent his one and only son, Jesus, that we are no longer victims. We are victors. Mark put out this call to everyone last week, and I'll put it out again today. We welcome the opportunity to meet with you and pray with you and talk with you more about your new life and the things that come with journeying from victim to victor. If you're online and you want to speak with us, let us know. We would be happy to sit down with you. So let's pray this prayer together. Lord God, thank you for the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. Please help us, each one, to live in constant awareness of that. I pray especially for those among us who have forgotten that and who are not feeling very victorious right now. Those who are facing threats, who are passing through the fire, who feel the enemy stalking them like a lion, please give them your grace and help us all to live moment by moment and day by day as the more than conquerors that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we come into the time of communion this morning, uh, I want you to think about salvation. See, if we look at our God and we look at what he's done throughout the lives of the people in the Bible, we see that salvation comes in many forms in many different ways, and he's brought salvation to many people through all time. Our God is a God that saves. And that is why he sent his son Jesus to save us in the fact that he lived and walked among us so that we could join with him and be one with him in that salvation that God brings to all. And it all is based on what? What did God say in there? That if we have faith in his son Jesus, if we believe that he is who he says he is, that he is the son of God, if we believe that in our heart of hearts, our holy of holies, if we believe that, then what, what is he going to do? He, through his grace, he will give us salvation. He will save us from ourselves, from our sinful nature. And so that salvation is there available for us any time. On the night that he was given up, Jesus took bread and he, he broke it and he said to the disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Meaning be a part of this body. Likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it and he blessed it. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. In other words, he wants us to participate in that salvation. By breaking the bread and drinking of the cup, that we are participating in the salvation that Christ has for us and that he set forth for us on the cross. The body of Christ, broken for you, take. The blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. And as always, thanks be to God. So, we thank God for this time and opportunity to intercede in prayer for others as we come into the time of prayers for people. And uh, Denise isn't here. 
about she has got a calling from God. She's she has got her his hand on her because boy she does a great job with prayers. I'm just gonna tell you. So good choice, Steve. Uh, <laughs> but in our time for prayers from people here, do we have anyone who needs to be lifted up? I have a, I have a friend that in recovery that he's going he's got um MS and their doctors are trying to figure out kind of a combination of medication that's been out and out and it's kind of got them out of whack a little bit. Yeah. So it's a deep Mikey prayer. Mike? Yep. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, my nephew, Max. Okay. All right. I'll lift up Max as well. Denise and Carrie have made it to Kearney. All right. <laughs> so they still got ways to go. So Cool. Yeah. About another six and a half hours, as I remember. I think I've a couple times. Anything else? All right, let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, we have people who are suffering in this world today. We have people who need your touch, your presence, and we need your healing, Lord. We have a friend of, of Denny's, Lisa, who was in a motorcycle accident on July 4th, and her body is very, very badly injured. And Lord, we know that your hand is in it because you lifted her up out of that situation. You brought her through the situation. Yes, she's got a lot of healing to do, and we ask, Lord, that you would give her that healing touch today. And we ask, that Lord, that you would bless her in many, many different ways as well. And we lift up her family and her husband as well. Uh, and we just ask, Lord, that they, they would be healed in the way that you found that they need to be healed. Lord, we had uh, uh, someone at our 50th anniversary our reunion, I should say, last night. Uh, her name is Helen. She's had heart issues. Um, she collapsed and fell and hurt her leg. And we just ask a blessing on Helen today and on her family as they take care of her. And as she recuperates, we just ask, Lord, that you would uh, lift her up and to uh, heal her quickly. Uh, also, several classmates are facing serious illnesses at this point, and, and uh, they wanted to come and, and make their presence uh, one last time with the rest of their classmates. And we just lift them up as well today to you. We ask a special blessing on Lynette's parents as, as they're facing some challenges in their life, and we ask their life situation, Lord, that you would be in it and that you would help them along the way. We ask prayers for Denise and Carrie and Jace uh, for safe travel as they're coming back. This last stretch of the journey here, coming across from, from Kearney back to Sea Rabbits here, we just ask that your hand would be upon them for travel mercies, safe travel, and blessings as they travel together. Lord, we ask for uh, prayers for Mike, who's got MS, and he's in recovery as well, Lord. We know that you are bringing him through the troubles that he faced in his life, and, and he's actually on the way home. And so we just ask, Lord, that you would go ahead and lift him up as well. And we ask prayers for Max today and, and the uh, troubles that he has in his life. And Lord, we, we live in a broken world, in a fallen world, and we ask that you would surround this world with your love, that you would surround your this world with your grace and your mercy. And we would ask that you would pull those people away from the distractions that keep them victor, victims instead of being victors, as we know that you want them to have a fulfilled life uh, in and through you. So Lord, we lift those people up as well today, and we ask for an awakening in our world, awakening in our society, awakening in our government. Uh, Lord, that we could uh, be victors and not victims of the society we live in today. We praise you and thank you in all these things. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. No, you don't want to come and see Papa? I got a new name now. The other kids call me Grandpa. She calls me Papa T. The R's are a little hard. It's easy.
to look at our situation and say, and just think there's no way out. It's easy to be overcome and overwhelmed by the world because that's what the world is teaching us right now. But we have a God who can. First thing I thought of for today's worship set was, of course, Cain's Yes He Can. But there were so many different songs to choose from. It was very difficult. She knows what she wants, so she's going to get whatever she can do to be that victor. That means being held by somebody. But see, that's how we are with God. You know, when asked why someone raises their hands in worship, somebody said, it's just like a small child raising their hand up to her parent, waiting to be picked up. God can and will help us through the situations. It may hurt as we go through them. It may not be the best outcome as we go through it. But in everything that God does, there is blessing. Maybe not immediately. And it's just like our prayers. He doesn't answer them right away. Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's no. And oftentimes it's not yet. We have to be patient. But God will get us through each and everything. We do not have to be victims. That's a choice. Just as I was reading in Romans this morning, it's a choice to sin. It's a choice to do things. It's a choice to say things. Choose to be a victor. Choose to allow God who can and will, and who ultimately sent his son to save us. Father God, no matter what our situation, no matter what our circumstance, we thank you. We thank you that you will deliver us through it. We just need to reach out to you. Father, don't let our confidence in you be shaken by the world, because that's what the world wants to do. That's what the Satan wants to have happen. He wants to have our confidence and our faith in you shaken. But Lord, we serve you. We serve you who we know can and will deliver us. Thank you, Father, for all the things that you do for us. Thank you for the many blessings. And most assuredly, thank you for the gift of your son. Let us constantly be working to improve our relationship with you, let us constantly be talking to you and listening to what you have to say to us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.